Um, so today we have Mayank Rathi uh, speaking on ALSA Secure Aggregation for Federated Learning with Malicious Actors. Um, uh, thanks for having me. Um, today I'll be talking about our recent work, ELSA Secure Aggregation for Federated Learning with Malicious Actors. This is joint work with uh, Tom, Samir, and Ruka. All of them were at work here at that point, and it appears at Open this year. So I recently asked Chad GPD uh, about the importance of data and machine learning, and it said that data is the lifeblood of machine learning. And it's true in saying that uh, we have heard this enough from machine learning practitioners that large amounts of high quality data is equal to better machine learning. Which means that if you want to improve uh, machine learning and the application that it can apply to, we need to be looking out for sources of data that satisfy this requirement. And one of those sources is mobile phones. All the big uh, um, online services you can think of, Wikipedia, Snapchat, Netflix, LinkedIn, YouTube, most of their data is consumed uh, and uh, used on mobile phones, which makes mobile phones an excellent source for the data uh, on which you can train models. But uh, there's some uh, considerations uh, that don't usually appear with other sources of data that do appear when you're dealing with data that is generated on mobile phones. And there are two uh, considerations in particular. The first one is that, is this data always reliable? And the answer is, it's not because uh, a phone can have faulty sensors. Uh, believe it or not, botnets still exist, especially on Android phones. Uh, and the quality of data that a phone generates cannot always be controlled properly. So you're dealing with something which might not be reliable. That is the first consideration. And the second one is that, is it privacy sensitive? And again, it is uh, often uh, contains personal information about the user. And this information is extremely uh, sensitive. So, so uh, in this talk, uh, I'll be focusing on one uh, an emerging paradigm of uh, machine learning, federated learning, which uh, is very well suited for doing machine learning on uh, data that is generated by mobile phones, right? And uh, we'll be looking at uh, through the lens of uh, data reliability and privacy, the two considerations that I just mentioned. Okay, so uh, what is federated learning? At a high level, you have this uh, federation of users. Uh, three, three mobile phones here each have their own data set. And the goal that they have in mind is to start off with a, an untrained global model. And at the end, and at the end, uh, be able to learn this uh, global model that uh, is like one model for everyone. It sort of captures the collective uh, data set that all the clients have. Oh, that's good. And in this process, uh, a user, uh, like uh, a server, usually helps them. Uh, this is the central server, which coordinates uh, the interaction between these users to make uh, the machine learning uh, go through. Right? So before we get into the more technical details, I want to quickly mention some applications. So federated learning is actually being used in the real world and is deployed by Google for the Gboard uh, app that uh, a lot of people might be using. It uses that for predictive typing, query prediction, multi prediction, and so on. There are many more applications. It looks like the Gboard uses my algorithm. Which it one? It uses my print exam algorithm. Which one? <laughs> the, I have the tan and feedback algorithm, binary tree algorithm. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, that is uh, just uh, uh, one of many applications. That this has. Uh, okay, so let's start by looking at the original FL protocol that was proposed back in 2016, which is called the federated averaging. The idea is it's a four step, uh, four step iterated protocol. In the first step, uh, each client is going to train a local model using uh, the data set that it has. In the second, in the second step, uh, all the clients are going to send the gradients of this these uh, these local models to the, the server. The server is then going to aggregate these together to uh, update the global model. And in the last step, uh, the server is going to broadcast the new global model to the clients. And this process iterates so the clients are going to update this model again with their local data. So it keeps going on until uh, we achieve an accuracy which is desired for the application. Right? So in this talk, I'm, I'm going to be uh, going into a lot of FL protocols. 
So before we get into that, uh, let's establish a metric so that we can analyze uh, how well a particular protocol performs. So there's going to be two performance metrics we're going to be looking at, efficiency and security. Uh, under efficiency, uh, we'll be interested in a good end-to-end -end, end -end runtime. It's pretty obvious why that is something you, you would desire. The second one is that this one is actually more nuanced and hasn't really been considered a lot in prior works, but we argue this is a very important topic. Uh, this property, property relates to uh, can bandwidth constraint clients uh, participate in your protocol or not? Now, you might ask, why is that, why is that a good property to have? The reason is that uh, a lot of research, has, a lot of surveys have been done, for example, this one by a few research center, which showed that uh, minorities tend to use, uh, are more likely to use uh, uh, mobile data as their primary source of internet access, which means that they don't have uh, an unlimited amount of data to spare for these, these applications, which means uh, you need to be uh, aware of uh, such participants in the protocols which might benefit from federated learning in general, and our gear protocol should be able to support a client which doesn't uh, have a lot of benefit. The next one is uh, uh, malicious privacy. What it means is that if the server that coordinates all the clients is malicious, uh, even in that case, uh, privacy is maintained. By privacy, you mean that, uh, I mean that uh, uh, the data set that, that is used uh, by each client should remain private from the server. From and lastly, we have a uh, poisoning resilience. The previous property was about privacy. This one is about accuracy. Uh, in, a, in a protocol like parallel learning, you can have malicious servers and malicious clients. And you want to be able to uh, weed out the clients who are sending malformed uh, updates. These are the four the properties. Uh, yeah. So why are we concerned with the bandwidth? Like, if the bandwidth is low, it will just take a larger amount of time to convey the. Oh, by bandwidth, I mean like how much is, does the protocol expect the clients to send? That's so, just okay. communication. Okay. But this is just one metric, right? Yes. Just is there any reason to single this metric out? So, uh, with, the, with that metric, we pair that with end to end efficiency. So, when both of them are together, then uh, uh, it's pretty reasonable that uh, you, you, can, you can have applications where. Uh, you don't really need that, but when you're trying to do, for example, for the Google application that I talked about before, these are the two metrics that kind of uh, uh, for efficiency make more sense. So this is just for for some fixed utility parameter. Yes, correct. Uh, and uh, the federated averaging protocol uh, does well on efficiency, but does not have uh, any of the security properties uh, that uh, we desired. And this is the right time to bring in uh, a prior work, but I'll first, I first want to mention uh, why federated averaging does not have any of the security properties. Uh, the first one is, let's look at why it does not have privacy. So the idea with uh, federated, federated averaging is that you have privacy numbers, right? Everyone is sending their variants. If the server aggregates them together, then whatever outcomes uh, is a, uh, Objects doesn't hide everything, but you can expect that each client submission is not hidden amongst the submission that the other clients submit. But uh, in this protocol right now, we don't have privacy because uh, all the, the clients are sending their uh, gradient directly to the server. Server sees all the gradients independently, and uh, that's it, uh, and it has been shown by prior work that you can use that to inward uh, lock locklessly or something. Like usually with some loss, but sometimes block, let's say to uh, get back to the entry of original data set. This is the privacy issue that federated averaging has. And this is such a well-known problem that uh, government agencies have been um, incentiv incentiv incentivizing research in this direction with uh, cash prizes for like $500,000 uh, to build privacy preserving federated learning solutions. Right? Uh, the other problem that federated averaging has is the accuracy issue that I mentioned. Let's say the client on the top is malicious. It submits uh, a malformed variant. If the server is going to add all these gradients together, whatever error it introduced in the first variant is going to uh, percolate down to the global model and it's going to uh, poison the entire, uh, entire state. Uh, so clearly, federated averaging has both of these issues. And uh, for a long time, the, uh, the research in this area was 
focused either on just fixing the poisoning resilience issue, which uh, which I'll refer to that entire line of work as uh, FL defensive, or the malicious privacy issue, uh, which was uh, the secure aggregation line of work, mostly from Google. It was only until recently that uh, this work group will sort of marries both of these direct, uh, both of these uh, properties together and uses the knowledge tools for that, but it's super expensive. And uh, this is sort of the lay of land when you think of uh, works that use a single server, which is the original uh, setup. That is, there's one server and many clients. But there's uh, a part. Um, how, how about eCorn? That's a very recent paper from Google. Uh, they, they said that they are much better than Rothel and they only use this one, uh, they only use one server. Uh, I ha I'll have to check that uh, okay. how it fits uh, into the into the picture, but uh, I guess uh, just because it's a single server model, it's gonna it's still gonna be quite inefficient because Rofil is like two or well, they they said that they're um so they are still using secure aggregation, but they can also um do some like input validation with um they claim that the overhead is negligible basically to the plain text or uh, not to the plain text, but to the like non poisoning resistance, for example. I also have some question. What about the, I mean, like uh, um, Dan Bonet and um, Harry, like, did they have some? Yeah, yeah, which is what I was coming at. Uh, with, oh. So there's a parallel line of work uh, which uses uh, two servers, uh, mm -hmm. uses distributed trust. And in that line of work, yeah, you have uh, uh, other protocols that are much faster than Rupil. Uh, for example, Creo and then, yeah, the work that you were mentioning, uh, fully immersive to be an IOP. Uh, but the problem is they still don't uh, satisfy the kind of efficiency we want uh, in our protocol, which is why I have this table right here. Uh, this is all, this just summarizes all that I said so far. I want to quickly mention that the, the reason I have, uh, I don't have a concrete uh, uh, yes or no there is because there doesn't exist implementation yet of the fully linear IoT construction. Although, although we think that we estimate that it's going to be quite efficient. But the bigger problem is that even if, even if you consider those works, you don't have the bandwidth of CFO client. The client bandwidth is required from the protocol is still very high. Can you elaborate on your notion of efficiency? Because for instance, in the prior paper, they say they are efficient, right? So but like maybe it helps to be more concrete. Like yes. What does they need to be efficient? Um, it's, it's it's like uh, what we propose in this work is like an order of magnitude better than Creo. So is it like a, a it's a particle improvement? Or no, it's it, these are just concrete concrete improvements, not as a target. Um, so is the, is the improvement mostly in, in terms of bandwidth? It's improvement both in bandwidth and end-to-end time, both of them. End-to-end time, you mean compute and bandwidth. I mean, the end-to-end, -end, the, the other factor is compute, right? Uh, other factors compute, and also what happens between the two servers. They also have a separate communication channel. Uh, this is just, the, this column here is just what client communicates to the servers. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, yeah, three things. Uh, what client communicates, the server competition, and the server communication. I see. And, and in your work, is it like two servers or all the servers? Two servers. It's also two servers. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk more about why these prior works don't have the uh, required high of time bandwidth. But this is where I, I want to bring in this work Creo Plus, which is uh, which I haven't talked about so far because it doesn't have the security property that we want, malicious privacy. But the other, but if you ignore that for a moment, then it has uh, all the other three uh, properties. It's sufficient and it has many uh, and and this is where Elsa comes in. Uh, our protocol. Uh, Fix up the malicious privacy problem with Creo, uh, Creo Plus, and uh, that's how we achieve all, all these good properties. Okay, so this is where the talk starts getting more technical. And uh, the agenda for the rest of the talk is uh, first, I'm going to choose the defense. What I mean by that is I'm going to fix, uh, for the sake of simplicity, a way for the servers to weed out malform gradients. Uh, once we have the defense, I'm going to explain why prior works require the clients to have high communication, like uh, to communicate a lot. And then we, we, we're going to look at the issue with Creo Plus, and finally, I'm going to introduce us. All right, so let's start with the first thing. Let's do the defense. So the problem right now is that if, the, if, if a client is malicious, let's say the client who submits the first query is malicious, it can submit like a large value. And when aggregation happens, this large value is going to overshadow all the honest values that were submitted, right? So a simple fix to uh, for this issue is that if we if we impose an upper bound on all the values that are submitted, 
then uh, no longer that the, the overshadowing that was happening before no longer happens. And we mitigate this problem to some degree. And that is what we are going to do for now. We're going to fix this defense for simplicity and we will assume an upper bound alpha. So any value, if a client submits any value more than alpha, the client is just kicked out of it because uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's what I'm doing for now. And I should mention that obviously this defense uh, does not stop all malform gradients. You still can uh, inject malform gradients in the protocol. And later in this talk, I'm going to be talking about uh, more sophisticated defenses, which have been empirically shown to work well against uh, sophisticated attacks. And we'll come to that later in the talk. But for now, let's do this. Okay. So why do the current schemes uh, have client uh, do a lot of communication? This is what happens in all the two server schemes right now. There's a client. The client has a gradient vector. It secret shares this vector between the two servers, and the servers are going to do a uh, aggregation and then open the aggregated value and move on with the rest of the protocol, right? So if, if in this setting, uh, we impose an upper bound on each client value, then the problem is that uh, if you distributed range proofs are very expensive over field elements. Uh, if you try to directly uh, uh, put a, a, a distributed range proof on this, on this gradient vector, it's gonna be super inefficient. And in practice, what people do is that they decompose the vector down into bits and then use the number of bits as a proxy for the upper bound. What I mean by that is that let's say here that uh, the client is using two bits to represent each value, which means uh, which automatically imposes an upper bound that the value represented by those bits cannot be more than three, for example. So this way, the number of bits can be, yeah. Uh, does that mean you use a uh, lot of bits to represent one field element? Yes, that is correct. But isn't that in this case, we have like a most significant bit, which is more important than the uh, least significant bit. Yes, but you still need to convey your gradient to the server so that it can aggregate. So you still need to convey all that information, right? Um, so maybe my question is like, all, all the bits there are not like symmetric or equal. Some bits are more important too. Yes, that, that is true. Yeah, that is completely correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't affect what I'm saying. Okay. And uh, with this sort of this expansion you see here, you can see that the size of the vector blows up by a factor of log alpha, right? The number of entries uh, in the vector uh, blows up by a factor of log alpha. And uh, now the question is, which separates actually Prio plus from the other works which are based on distributed proofs is how do these, how are these bits secret shared between the two servers? So uh, Prio, Full linear PCPs and IOPs, if you use them, like works based on distributed proofs, uh, the client is going to secret share these bits themselves as arithmetic values, right? So uh, because the server has to aggregate them. Uh, if, if they're not shared as the arithmetic value, the server cannot aggregate them. And because of that, the client communication is uh, blown up by a factor of log alpha, like I mentioned before. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the, the Prio plus uh, line of work uh, it pushes the expansion, like pushes the conversion from Boolean to arithmetic to the server itself. So the server uh, does this uh, sort of Boolean to arithmetic conversion, which means that there's no blow up in client communication. And the client is still able to prove that whatever it's sending is upper bounded. Um, so uh, PO plus does support bandwidth constrained clients, but uh, does not have malicious privacy. You might ask, ask why. The reason is that this is what happens on the server on PO plus. Clients submit uh, uh, their gradients to the server. The server uh, servers do this uh, Boolean to arithmetic conversion, which is semi-honest. Obviously, a semi-honest uh, protocol would not have privacy if the server is malicious. So you might say, uh, okay, why not use a, a malicious secure B-Way here and that will fix our problem. But that's again gonna be very expensive. It's, it's gonna be an order of magnitude more expensive than the semi-honest one. And because of that, uh, Prio Plus is uh, efficiency uh, guarantees go away. So as soon as you bring in malicious privacy using that approach, uh, you lose on uh, uh, efficiency. And this is where our work comes in. We provide malicious privacy almost for free. It's just a seven to 25% runtime overhead over, uh, over not providing malicious privacy at all. Uh, any questions uh, until now? Um, compared to semi honest privacy or just from that? semi honest privacy. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's understand uh, how we achieve that. 
So uh, the servers uh, in Prio Plus have these two steps. The first step, they do a B2A. And in the second step, uh, once everything is uh, in arithmetic shares, they can do the local aggregation and then open, open stuff. Now, the first observation you make here is that the second part, uh, uh, and let's say that the server on the top is malicious. Uh, we are working a two server model where at most one server can be malicious. Let's say the server on the top is malicious. If you, if you focus on the second part uh, here, uh, an interesting property we have here is that if, even if the server is malicious, it cannot affect privacy. All the attacks that a malicious server can do here uh, don't affect privacy. These are just additive only attacks. Uh, and uh, with this interesting property, we can actually just ignore this phase completely when we when we are focusing on malicious privacy, because that phase is safe, uh, does not affect privacy even if the server is malicious. Okay. So we focus on the first phase, focus on the first phase where the B two A is happening. What's B two A? Uh, it's a Boolean to arithmetic conversion that the server oh. is converting Boolean shares to arithmetic shares. Uh -huh. Uh, in the B2A phase, uh, something uh, interesting again is happening uh, here is that the B2A happens independently for uh, each client's gradients. So uh, initially there were like many clients in the protocol. What we can do is we can simplify this problem down to the case where there's just one client. This client has a bunch of secret shares, which are Boolean, and it asks the server to uh, do the Boolean to arithmetic conversion, right? And I'm going to go one step further and even simplify this problem more to the generalized problem more where we just have one client has some sort of secret shares. It gives to the servers and the servers do some two PC on the shares. And this is the generalized problem uh, we're going to take and uh, provide malicious privacy to. You can basically forget about federated learning uh, from this point onwards. Um, uh, yeah, and one of the properties of the 2PC happening here is that uh, it's known publicly what 2PC is happening. For example, in the federal learning case, uh, the clients knew that uh, it was a B2A. In some other application, it can be something else. But the idea is that the 2PC uh, that's happening between servers is known publicly. OK, and, and obviously for the 2PC, the servers have some random data. So here's the, here's the key idea. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this 2PC in terms of the next message function. So uh, the next message function uh, outputs what the next message uh, uh, a party has. And it, uh, its inputs are uh, the inputs to the protocol, random tape, uh, transcript so far, and the functionality F that is being computed. And I guess I'm just, at a high level, I'm a little confused. So are you worried about malicious server or malicious client? Malicious server. Oh, it's not about malicious client. Malicious client, we uh, use the defense of upper bounding the value, upper bounding each uh, gradient value. That sort of mitigates the malicious client issue. Oh, yeah, I, I see. So you just like. Um, so right now, just focus on. You're just uh, worried about the malicious. You're not seeing any proofs on the client side. Just... The proof was the fact that the client can only submit this many bits and not more than that. And the number but, of. But bits... That's not the part you're using during our proof. That's just uh, using a small number of bits to encode the value. Exactly. That is the Creo Plus idea. We don't really need these ZK rules at all for that, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, we're going to look at the next message function. And uh, this is uh, the main part of the talk. So if you look at the next message function, let's look at what the client has, uh, what the client already knows. The client knows the inputs to the protocol because the client is the one who, secret, who generated the secret shares to that. And the client also knows the functionality of that is being computed. Now, if you bear with me for a moment and uh, let me give the clients the random tips of both the servers as well. Let's just assume that that is okay to do and I'll explain why that is okay to do. Then uh, something interesting happens. Uh, the client can now emulate the entire interaction that happens between servers because the client has all the information to do that. Uh, which means that the client can generate these expected two PC messages uh, that the server should be sending to each other. How does that help? It helps because if the, if the server on the top is malicious and it sends malformed messages, the server on the bottom is going to cross check them with what the client sent. And if they mismatch, the client at the, the server at the bottom is going to abort. And uh, this is how uh, we achieve malicious privacy. Can you just send the a final messages to the server, so they don't really need the two PC. 
Any one small bandwidth, so it's like maybe hashing it down to a guideline. Oh, yes, okay. that is correct. That is what I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that that fixes this problem. Now uh, let's go back to this issue that uh, is it okay to send the random tapes to the client? Uh, because the client can be malicious, right? And we were using uh, the B2A to sort of like prevent against uh, a malform gradients. If a client is malicious, does it get any benefit from knowing the random tape? And the answer is uh, no. Because the B2A functionality or any functionality, UPC functionality that's happening here just depends on two things, the input and the functionality itself. Random tape is not a part of the input. It just provides privacy. Which means that uh, we do have malicious privacy with this simple approach. Uh, but the problem is we don't have efficiently or bandwidth constrained clients right now because uh, the clients are sending at least as many messages as the two servers send to each other. And yeah, and like uh, Lee just mentioned, uh, we're gonna optimize that communication. One simple fix is that the client can send one hash per round of the messages that servers exchange between each other, uh, rather than sending the entire messages. Uh, but uh, actually, we can do better, and this comes back to what we were saying. Yeah. So there, there are these special types of protocol uh, where you can defer checks right to the end. I'm going to call them deferred check safe protocols, and these protocols appear everywhere in MPC. Uh, whenever you're going from secret shares to secret shares, uh, you have this problem. Uh, which means that if you have a protocol like this, then the client can just send one hash uh, for the entire interaction that happens between the servers. And as long as the server at the bottom, like the honest server, cross checks the hash before the final opening, you should be okay. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, sort of the, the idea. And uh, now the question is, is B2A uh, that we were using before, is it defer check safe? And the answer is yes. If you use a commonly used uh, obvious transfer to, uh, to do that, then uh, B2A is going to be defer check safe. Which means that the client, uh, all that the client is sending is just Boolean shares and it's one hash uh, along with that. So uh, that provides all of these three properties. And this wraps up the first part of the talk. Uh, where, uh, I guess for the client to know the random tape, you need to send some random seed and use some PRG to yes, extend. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, focus. Uh, I'm we, uh, we're going to uh, move forward from the simple defense of upper bounding the values, and we're going to look at more sophisticated defenses that are actually used in practice. One of those defense is uh, norming the uh, is bounding the L2 norm of which is, which is shown right here. So you, you want to make sure that whatever vector the client is submitting, its L2 norm is less than some value of. And it has been shown uh, recently uh, at Oakland last year that empirically this works very well uh, for a lot of sophisticated poisoning attacks uh, that, that are seen in practice. So we're going to focus on this defense. Uh, but unlike the previous defense, which was much simpler, in this defense, just OTs for B2A don't suffice. You actually need to use beaver triples, and generating beaver triples between the servers is going to be expensive. So we need to fix that problem as well. Otherwise, uh, the efficiency uh, goals we have in mind are not going to be met. And to do that, uh, what we do is uh, what we observe here, which is also already been observed. I don't understand the problem definition. Are you saying you want to check the message submitted by the client that found the norm? Yes. So, so now, now you are considering malicious clients. Yes. Problem yes, because uh, I said that yeah, you know, this fixes all of these problems. But then we go back, and now we are again. Uh, the oh. problem with malicious server has been fixed. Okay. And now we come back to the case where uh, the client uh, is malicious, and we want to use better defenses to defend against that. Are there any questions so far? Uh, yeah, so it's going to be expensive though. What we do here is that uh, we have the client generate beaver triples. Now you might ask, why is that a good idea? That is a good idea because client can generate them locally. It doesn't require any cryptography to do that. And the client can just send them over to the server. The server can use them. But obviously the server doesn't trust the client because the clients are malicious. So they're going to use this sacrifice uh, protocol, this well-known speed sacrifice protocol to validate that whatever triples the client is sending are correct. Now this it's is- like cut and choose, right? Just choose some random- You can also use, but cut and choose is usually used for uh, uh, protocols which have a, a honest majority. Uh, for dishonest majority, speed sacrifice uh, is, the, is the way to go. 
you just use one triple to sacrifice one, you sacrifice one triple divided into the other one. So it's just a 2x, I mean, 2x overhead of a number of triples in the program. So this is a simple fix uh, to the efficiency problem. But uh, the problem here is that the two PC that happens between the two servers now is no longer uh, emulatable by the client. Why? Because the two PC now uh, uses this random challenge that the servers generate. And this random challenge cannot be known to the client because that is what the soundness of sacrifice relies on. Mm -hmm. So uh, the challenge cannot be shared with the client, which means that the client cannot generate the next messages of itself and the emulation fails. So how do we fix that? Um, the way we fix that in this work is we separate out the two PCs that are happening here in two separate PCs, basically independent of each other in some sense. Uh, and uh, we made the client too round. Uh, just for now, I'm going to fix that later. Uh, in, uh, in the first round, uh, the client uh, just does the B2A. Uh, and just sends the, the information that a server needs to do the B2A, which we already talked about that is okay to do because the client can emulate that interaction between the servers. And in the second round, the client, uh, the servers are going to reveal the challenge to the clients. Now, why is that okay to do? Because by this point, the client has already committed to the weaver triples. That happened in the first round. So it's okay to uh, reveal the challenge uh, to the client. And once the client knows the challenge, it can do the rest of the emulation, which it was not able to do. So you say you want to check the bounded norm. Are you checking it in the two PC between the servers? Yes. Yeah. And for that, the correlations are being sent by the client. Is that efficient? Like, how can you check the efficiency? Uh, because uh, you, you you get uh, you, you just need two things for that. You need OTs and you need viewer triples. And uh, you can get uh, clients to do all of that work for you. And you just check that uh, between the two servers efficiently. What does this server need to compute in the two PC protocol? Do they need to compute the, the, the norm, the, the alpha norm of the vector? They compute the square of the alpha norm. So they just compute sum of squares. And squares uh, can easily be computed using viewer triples and then just sum them up and check uh, whether this is less than some value. Oh, so you're just implementing a protocol that computes all the, the squares and sum them up. Exactly. Wait, uh, are you revealing the norm of the lines? No, that, that is not true. Because then, then it would become a trivial problem. If you do that. Wait, if, if you just sum up the square of those values, that's not an L2 norm, right? Yes, uh, because you're operating over rings and rings can over. Oh. And you don't really need as an off. Okay, let me let me go back and show you this. Uh, oh, that's not. I can just square both sides and do still do the same comparison, right? I can rather than. Oh, yeah. So, so I there's no cross room. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay, so the protocol right now is two rounds, and uh, this can actually be made one round by. Uh, distilling out all the uh, other stuff that's happening here and by just looking at the sacrifice and the viewer triples, right? So uh, there's a client on one end, there's servers on the other end. Client sends some viewer triples. Servers, uh, after the first round, reveal the challenge uh, to the client and then the client sends the hash of the sacrifice. So this can be cast as a the public coin challenge or response to the call. And we can use a distributed variant of Yer Shimir uh, from 2019 to make this a single round protocol. So, so when you say it's like 17 to 25 percent, does that include the, yes. this? Uh, yes. But isn't this like the more heavyweight part of the, the, the server to server, the, the two, two PC? Now, now you have to compute more. The server to server two PC is actually, uh, uh, it's all, it, it's all, it all becomes information theoretic once the clients and are. I, yeah, I guess my question is about the bottleneck. Like, because if the server computes is the bottleneck, like it should be more than 17 to 25 percent, right? Uh, having to compute this versus not having to compute it. Oh, so uh, 7 to 25 percent was uh, when you have a semi honest protocol, uh, where the server is semi honest versus when the server is malicious. This is about malicious clients. It's a, it's so, like, so the semi honest protocol has malicious clients. Is that what you're Yes, Sem that oh. is just semi honest servers. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to move on to evaluation now. Uh, so the first comparison we do is, is with Prio for VEC, uh, and uh, 
the defense we use for this comparison is the simplified defense that I talked about at the beginning, like individually of the bounding dependence. And here, uh, the OTs that the servers need for the video are being sent by the clients. Uh, I'm cheating a little bit, bit here because uh, you might ask, okay, that means that the client are communicating a lot. We, you're not, uh, the client are not bandwidth, uh, you're not considering bandwidth constraint clients anymore, but I'm going to talk about that uh, in just two slides from now. Why, uh, even if the clients don't send OTs to the servers, the protocol still remains almost the same, uh, preserves almost the same efficiency. So uh, over uh, Creo, we are eight times better in end to end runtime, of which the split is 16x better in server runtime and three and a half x better in client runtime. Uh, compared to Rofil, uh, our gains are obviously, since Rofil is a single server uh, protocol, the gains are uh, more than two orders of magnitude. Uh, and uh, lastly, I want to talk about focus on this part that uh, how does our protocol actually support clients who cannot communicate a lot? So I'm going to use two modes for that, a moderate mode, in which case the clients who are bandwidth constraints are okay sending just a little bit more, but not too much. Uh, in this case, all the normal clients are sending OTs and triples to the servers, but the clients who are bandwidth constraints are only sending the triples, which already reduces their bandwidth requirement by 16 times. And in this case, if 10% of the clients are bandwidth constraints, constrained, there's only a 5% increase uh, in, in runtime and just a 15% increase uh, in server communication. So the, the protocol almost preserves its efficiency. And when half of the clients are bandwidth constrained, it's just a 30% increase in runtime and less than 2x uh, increase in, uh, in server communication. This is the first case. In the second case, uh, the client clients are so bandwidth constraints, they they're going to send the least uh, the least amount of data that they can send to to uh, make the protocol happen. So they are only sending the gradient, nothing else, which means that they are communicating one thirty seven times lower than uh, the rest of the clients. And in that case, uh, ten percent of the clients are uh, uh, are sending only the gradients. Then there's a less than two x increase in both runtime and communication. But uh, in the very unlikely case where 50% of clients in your protocol are, are not going to send anything. They're like, we are going to send the bare minimum in that case, which is which you shouldn't use with uh, usually seeing practice because that is too much. I talked about it, in, uh, about it initially that uh, minorities have this issue. You're not gonna have a minority problem uh, if it's, it already is, is reaching. In that case, uh, uh, the runtime increase is more than 3X and the, ser the server communication increase is also more than six x, which is pretty bad. Uh, which is why uh, we uh, propose a, another way to fix that. We're going to use a pseudo random correlation generators. I'm not going to go into detail details of that, but uh, the idea is that the client sends these succinct seeds to the server, and the servers can locally expand these seeds uh, to get uh, to generate OTs and VO triples and whatever correlations they want to do. And uh, uh, we estimate that uh, using existing protocols for uh, for PCGs, uh, you should be able to get similar numbers that I should show before. So with this with this optimization, all the clients uh, can operate in the low bandwidth, mode. and uh, they need to communicate the basically the bare minimum that that they can. So yeah, that is the end of my talk. Uh, I presented Elsa today, which has all these four properties that we sketched out at the beginning. Uh, our code is uh, open source at that link, and I'm going to take any questions now.